Welcome to the Cosmic Connection. What you're about to hear and see on this program may disturb you. Please keep an open mind, for you may find that the information disseminated on the Cosmic Connection different from anything in your past experience. The views and opinions on the Cosmic Connection are not necessarily those of the organization broadcasting this program. Neither are they the views of the government, which seeks to suppress the investigation of the subject of unidentified flying objects. These are not the opinions of hucksters and charlatans who co-opt the importance of this message by their vain attempts to rip off the public through fear and misinformation. The term which best describes this program is from the Latin, fiat lux, which means, let there be light. Welcome to the Cosmic Connection, your UFO connection for the Pacific Northwest here on the CAN Network, Channel 11. This is December 5th, 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our last program of this season. We will be coming back January 2nd. My co-host, Dennis, is back from assignment. Dennis, welcome to the program tonight. Thanks. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not be taking your telephone calls during this program. We have a special guest, Captain Kevin D. Randall, Reserve. He is the author and investigator of the Roswell uh, crash. Is that correct? Yes. The first book was entitled UFO Crash at Roswell. He was co-author with Don Schmidt. And we had Don Schmidt on and, uh, on the last program of our last season of the first season, if that's co confusing enough for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Randall is here. Uh, first of all, let's uh, take care of some old business first. Uh, let's see what we have here. Um, uh, the Martin paper, the group, uh, I believe that's something uh, you showed me last night, Dennis. Uh, uh, the, uh, th there was a, uh, this is a new news. Uh, dealing with a, a group. Would you care to elaborate on that a little bit, please? Well, uh, it was a AP story that went nationwide in all the newspapers. A uh, gentleman that had assembled a group of uh, cosmonauts, astronauts, military generals, and uh, they say they're about ready to go public and break the cover-up. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, brand new news, uh, talking about individuals who are uh, tired of uh, the secret uh, the, the secret police or whatever of uh, the, the government taking uh, the UFO information and keeping it suppressed from uh, the Americans at hand. Uh, we understand that people are possibly being abducted and taken against their will and uh, it's possible that exper heinous experiments are being uh, performed on individuals who uh, have a right to uh, in, in a free society as the United States. Also we have the X-Files. Uh, I believe we touched that uh, last on the last program. Uh, the X-Files have been a, uh, a television show that, in my opinion, was taken off, uh, was put on in place of sightings, the Fox Television Network program, which, uh, in my opinion, was doing a very, very uh, great service in the UFO community, uh, showing uh, the new uh, UFO flaps, as Dennis likes to call them, uh, around the United States and the world. They, spoke on several things. I'm sure you've seen the program to know enough about what sightings was. It was also backed by the actor and producer Henry, Henry Winkler, who played the Fonz on Happy Days. Uh, the X-Files now that has dropped into, the, uh, in, into the, the time slot of sightings states that there was a state that, that these, these programs and these stories were factual documents. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they are not factual documents. I will read here, in brief, a spokesman for the series flatly denies that any of the stories are from actual FBI files. Though some are fictionalizations of witnesses, real UFO claims 
Miami writer Harold Liebelson says a single secret source slipped him the bunch of great UFO documents included in the new Spanish language book, UFOs, The Whole Truth, which he co-wrote with Betty Rush. And one of these documents validates an, an American UFO project called Aquarius. And uh, from that, uh, we'll probably ask Mr. Randall, our guest tonight on The Cosmic Connection, uh, probably we'll touch on some of that. Uh, new business. Uh, Dennis, you're back. Uh, where were you, Dennis? I was in southern China. You went to southern China. We have Aliens Over Oregon. Uh, you will see a pamphlet on the book here that The Cosmic Connection, along with Dennis, has put together called Aliens Over Oregon on our uh, desk here, Camera 4. If you'd be so kind as to find Aliens Over Oregon and zoom in and we could get a picture of that, of Aliens Over Oregon on our desk here. Uh, Dennis has also brought up a new uh, pamphlet uh, we can make available for you uh, known as Aliens Over China. You want to... Right. While I was over there, uh, I stopped by the library and managed to find uh, several interesting news articles about uh, saucers being sighted over southern China, over Hong Kong, several places. And it was roughly during the same time period as the news clippings you see on the desk here. The two weeks before the crash at Roswell, which we'll be discussing tonight, the two weeks prior to that, our entire nation was buzzed with UFOs, with the majority of the sightings being right up here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, absolutely, uh, starting with um, uh, Kenneth, Arnold. Kenneth Arnold, that's right, thank you. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, um, what we're going to be discussing tonight is we're going to be making available to you, the public, brand new information dealing with the Roswell crash that happened some 43 years ago. Uh, no, 40 years ago, 1950? Uh, 1947. 47, okay. So uh, with that, we're going to take uh, Captain Kevin D. Randall. Sir, welcome to the Cosmic Connection. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, we sure are uh, honored uh, to have you on our program. Dennis is here. And uh, we'll start out with uh, what happened at Roswell. The conventional wisdom is that an object uh, was found. Actually, what happened was Mac Brazel, a, a rancher from uh, near the Corona, New Mexico, found a field full of strange metallic debris, we now believe, on the morning of July 5th. He didn't know what it was. He couldn't identify it. Believing that something had crashed, he took it to the rancher in Roswell, New, uh, I'm sorry, to the sheriff's office in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, the sheriff in turn called the uh, 509th Bomb Group at the Roswell Army Airfield. They investigated, uh, couldn't determine what it was, collected the debris, and shipped it on to the 8th Air Force headquarters in Fort Worth, where General Ramey, the commander of 8th Air Force, decided it was a weather balloon. And that's the way the thing remained for. 35 years until Jesse Marcel, the air intelligence officer of the 509th Bomb Group, came forward and said that he'd picked up pieces of a flying saucer uh, a number of years ago, and that launched the, the investigation into the Roswell case. Okay, very good. Now, I've understood that this 509th Bomber Wing that was located in New Mexico had several sightings of unidentified flying craft in the area, and what makes this place uh, significant was we were uh, testing uh, atom bomb capabilities. Is that correct? Well, the 509th Bomb Group was the uh, unit that had dropped the atomic bombs on Japan during the Second World War. And there, of course, there's all kind, there was all kinds of testing going on in New Mexico. The first atomic bomb was exploded at the Trinity site in central New Mexico. Rocket testing was going on at Alamogordo, which is about 125 miles from Roswell. So there's all kinds of important uh, atomic research being done in central New Mexico. The 509th Bomb Group, as I understand it, in 1947 had 14 atomic bombs. They were the only atomic strike force in the world at the time. Wow, amazing. Okay, now, we understand that, that you have uh, a movie coming out and, and, and a book. Uh, let's uh, recap again for our uh, new viewers. We have new viewers all the time. You have interviewed over 500 witnesses on the Roswell incident alone. Is that correct? We've, we've talked to more than 500 people conducting probably 2,000 interviews of those people in the last five years attempting to get to the bottom of the events that took place in Roswell. So, yeah, it's basically right. And so this book that I have here on my desk, uh, UFO Crash at Roswell, with uh, your co-author, Donald Schmidt, 
This is the first book, and a second book will be coming out shortly? Yes, the first book gives you an overview of what uh, the conventional wisdom was, what was going on in New Mexico in 1947, or going on in the UFO community, if you will, uh, in 1947, and, and, and tells the story from a more conventional point of view. What the new book, which we call Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, will do is focus more on what we call the impact site, the area where the craft and the bodies were found. Uh, it took us uh, a, a number of additional uh, months to, to learn exactly what happened there, and when the first book came out, we hadn't penetrated uh, the cover-up to that position yet. Now we know what happened on the, on the impact site. Well, I understand, Kevin, that the first book basically focused on the impact site and the events surrounding that, and now our focus has shifted to the impact site. Well, we, we focused on what we call the debris field, and this is the area that Mac Brazel found and what, what transpired there. And one of the problems that we've run into is we weren't uh, aware of, of exactly what had happened on the impact site when we wrote the first book. So some things that happened on the impact site when we were talking about the area where the craft was recovered, uh, we, we lumped them all together, and, and they need to be separated. So that an area of confusion developed because... Some of the things we were being told by one set of witnesses didn't agree with the others, and when we learned that there were two distinct sites, uh, the impact site um, and, and the debris field, by separating those two events, then things began to make more sense to us. For example, uh, there was a fellow named William Woody who saw the craft come down. Now, when we believed that the conventional wisdom was correct that the crash took place on the night of July 2nd, we have uh, uh, William Woody seen the thing come down, but from what his, his story was, that they went out to look for it, but were turned back by the military cordon. This didn't make sense because, as near as we could tell, the military cordon didn't go up till July 8th. Why would they wait f for five or six days before they went out to find this thing? It, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What we have learned is the crash took place on the evening of July 4th. The military knew it was down. They went in search and found the craft and the bodies, threw up the military cordon the next day. William Woody the next day went out and they ran into that military cordon. Then, at, at the same time this was happening, uh, up, in, up in, Ro uh, in, in the Corona area, Mac Brazel finds the debris field, and he comes down the next day. So we have, a, we have an event that takes place on a Friday night. Saturday, the military is picking up the craft and the body. Sunday, Mac Brazel finds the debris field, mm. and, and, and that brings it all back into play with the July 8th date that we've always associated with this event. How is that for confusing? So, so, so in other words, we, we have a, um, a, a conflicting uh, uh, story on, on just when it crashed. Is that correct? I, well, no, we don't have a conflicting story. I don't believe anymore. What has happened is... The conventional wisdom had been based on the Dan Wilmot sighting. Dan Wilmot was a Roswell resident who saw an object in the sky on July 2nd. Okay. The assumption had been this is what crashed. That was, a, that was a, a faulty assumption. That was not true. Based on what we've been able to learn from first-hand testimony and from some documentation is the crash took place late on the day of July 4th and that the military was aware of one aspect of the crash and went out and recovered the craft and the bodies on, on July 5th. Thinking they had cleaned up the whole thing, they're sitting around Roswell patting themselves on the back, unaware of the debris field, huh. which is what Mac Brazel found, and this site is about 40 miles from the impact site, so we were spread out over, over New Mexico. And, and, that's, and that's where we plug it back in. Mac Brazel then comes into Roswell on the 6th, Jesse Marcel, the Air Intelligence Office, the counterintelligence agent, follow Marcel back out to the ranch. They find the debris field and, and work at the 7th, come back into Roswell, and then, uh, then the 8th, uh, Walter Hott makes his press release right. and that sort of thing. So we, we plug it back in. All we've done is, to, is, is change the scenario so that the craft and the bodies were actually found before the debris field was. And by plugging this in this way, then some of the other testimony we had that... that confused us now makes more sense William Woody being one if the crash took place on the second why did they wait till the eighth before they went out and the answer is they didn't the crash took place on the fourth they went out the next day and found the military cordon around the impact site they never got up to where the uh, debris field was all right um sir Mr. Randall uh, ladies and gentlemen we're speaking with Captain Kevin D. Randall Reserve the author of UFO crash at Roswell. We've had uh, his book right here on our desk. We've had it on our desk uh, since uh, basically the beginning of the program. 
May I, uh, may I uh, call you Captain Randall, sir? Yeah, you, you, can call me, you can call me Kevin Randall if you'd like. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, bring up something uh, pretty sensitive, but uh, I, I'd like to just uh, clean this right now. Um, I heard a story of Gerald Anderson, and uh, we'd like to uh, understand just what the falsifying document is for our viewers, <laughs> and uh, so we can just uh, wipe this whole thing away about what he said and uh, what he lied about. Gerald Anderson was a fellow who lives in Missouri, and after seeing the Unsolved Mysteries program in, uh, I think, the, the rebroadcast in January of 1990, called their phone bank and said that he had been on the, on the, uh, the impact site. He'd seen the craft and the bodies, and that if we were interested in talking to him, we could do so. I interviewed him a couple of days later, and he told me a story very rich in detail. The problem was it didn't track with the information we were beginning to develop. It, 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 it followed the conventional wisdom of a crash on the plains of San Augustine, a separate event that, uh, that took place. His, his theory was that two objects had collided over the Corona, New Mexico area, one crashing near Roswell, one crashing 150 miles away. By checking out his story, there were a lot of inconsistencies in it that, that alerted us to the prob possibility he was lying. When we suggested his story might be less than true, um, there was all kinds of things said about our investigation and Gerald Anderson produced a phone bill showing that I had talked to him for 26 minutes. In reality, I'd talked to him for, 20, uh, for 54 minutes. The reason that trivia about the phone bill is important is because he presented a document showing a, a phone call of only 26 minutes. Later, we got a copy of the uh, phone bill from Southwestern Bell and learned the exact length of the phone call. What had happened is Anderson had faked the phone bill in an attempt to make me look bad. Uh -huh. So we had a document that this man had faked, had forged in an attempt to make me look bad. Then to compound it, uh, he admitted that he'd lied about the length of the phone call and, and presented another phone bill showing a phone call of 28 minutes. Well, we had the original document. Sure. So we have him faking two documents. So his credibility suffers. Now, when you take a look at his story, he said that uh, the leader of the archaeological expedition that Barney Barnett had spoken about was a fellow named Dr. Buskirk. We found Dr. Buskirk, and it turned out to be Anderson's high school anthropology teacher. In other words, we could put Anderson and Buskirk together ten years after this event. Oh, in I see. The sing a single high school in Albuquerque. To, this, to us, this smacked of, 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 of uh, a hoax. Sure. Uh, but as I say, what's, what's happened since then, we have found absolutely nothing to corroborate his story. He's admitted to lying about portions of it. It does not fit with the information we've been able to develop. He's clearly lied about a number of aspects of his story. And, and it's, it's, to us, his testimony has been thoroughly discredited. Now, I have a book coming out in about a year called The uh, History of UFO Crashes. And in that book, there'll be a long section about Gerald Anderson and, and, and gives all this in detail. There was also a meeting held in Chicago in February of 1992 where all the various investigators of, of the Anderson tale came together, Stanton Friedman, Don Berliner, Tom Carey, who's worked with Don and me quite a bit, Don Schmidt. It was medi mediated by Dr. F uh, Michael Sorge, and we all presented the evidence as best we could, and the publication was uh, written about, uh, called the Plains of San Augustine Controversy, July 1947, and it outlined... Uh, Friedman and Berliner's position had outlined our position. Uh, uh, Mark Rodiger had a, had a statement in there. Fred Whiting at the Fund for UFO uh, Research had a statement in there. So it kind of lays everything out. And then there's a, a final statement by Dr. Sorge. After that took place, we learned that Anderson had faked the phone bill, and we learned some other things about him. And at this point, I don't think there's hardly anyone left in the UFO community that accepts the Anderson testimony as authentic. Well, sir, that was, that was a very clear uh, outline of, of that particular subject. I want to thank you for clearing that up. Um, sir, I, I have people, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that write to me uh, a lot, and the same question comes up, and I, I'd like you as a UFO investigator to see if you could uh, touch this. Uh, why is there a cover-up of the UFOs, and who, who is it benefiting? I think probably the bene answering the benefiting question uh, first will be easiest by saying that the government perceives a benefit for them for the continued nature of the cover-up. Um, I think the cover-up began in 1947. Uh, this crash took place two weeks 
about two weeks after the first sighting was made, the first modern era sighting, if you will, with Kenneth Arnold in the Pacific Northwest, uh, seeing the nine objects uh, moving with a motion like saucer skipping across the pond. From that point on, there's about two weeks of time until we end up with the case at Roswell. Nobody had a clue as to what was going on. The government was arguing amongst themselves about it. The military was looking into it. The Atomic Energy Commission, everybody was denying that it was their secret projects, and they suspected somebody else. Suddenly in July, uh, on July 4th, we're presented with evidence that, that they're extraterrestrial in origin. And I think the cover-up began because they wanted an opportunity to take a look at this thing and to determine some things about it before they made any public announcements. And I think they were unable to determine much about it given the, the advanced nature of the technology. So we've got a situation that we've just come out of World War II. The government, quite naturally, is being a little bit uh, secretive about what it's doing and what it's developing. Once you have a cover-up or a, a, a something classified secret, there's a ver very uh, there, there's quite an inertia to keep it covered up and keep it classified. They don't declassify finds, uh, declassify things easily after that event. In the mid to early early to mid 1960s, the Brookings Institution did a study for the Congress about what would happen if there was a, a confrontation between people of Earth and an alien race, and this was through radio astronomy, not even a face-to-face -face confrontation. And they determined that it would be mostly bad for for our civilization if it was announced that there were aliens on another planet. And I think that sort of induced them to keep this thing secret as well. We've also heard from a number of sources that in 1947 the government did some things they're not proud of to keep it secret. They threatened kids, they threatened sure. people uh, to keep, keep this thing under wraps, and they don't want to admit uh, their violation of civil rights. And I think the final factor we have to look at is the 1938 broadcast of War of the World. Clearly this was a, a radio broadcast that talked about an, eva an invasion from outer space and people were being killed, but also during that broadcast it was announced four or five times that this was a, a, a radio program and a drama, not an actual news broadcast, but it still created a bunch of panic, and right. I think the government looked at that as well. Uh, and then they had other uh, areas of panic to look at. I guess in, uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor there was all kinds of jitters on on uh, the Pacific coast about the possibility of Japanese invasion, and uh, the movie 1941, I think, is kind of based on that hysteria. That right? Yeah. So, so, so you've got you've got the government looking at what will happen if they announce these sorts of things, and I think that's that's why the cover up has has um, w was started I I in those days. Why they wanted to keep it quiet? They wanted to, an opportunity to look at this thing so they could make some determinations before they announced it. All Once right. that was in place, it just kind of remained in place. Well, while we're on the subject of cover-up, could you speculate for a moment why in the world they would announce that they'd a captured a flying saucer to the world? And if Camera 4 could zoom in on that, we have the Roswell Daily Record front page there announcing uh, RAFF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Well, I think based on what we've been told by the participants in this, this was a carefully planned cover-up, and that was not uh, a mistake on the, their part. What they wanted to do and what they had done in the past is have a lower headquarters make a statement, then a higher headquarters comes out and refutes it. And what they were doing was trying to kill the rumors. The problem they had was they, they had um, the event take place on July 4th, and there were a number of people who saw the craft come down uh, and that was one thing that we, we hadn't gotten for the first book, is people who saw the thing in the air crashing. Uh, we now have five, I think, five separate uh, sources on that, uh, uh, all these places coming down. So uh, they, they've got that, that happening to them. There are rumors around the Roswell area about something going on. The sheriff has been involved. The fire department may have been involved. And there's... The, it, it's becoming worse and worse. Then you have Mac Brazel show up with debris, so it, 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 it begins to spread even more because now more of the deputies are involved in that sort of thing. And Brazel talks to Frank Joyce at the Roswell radio station KGFL, so he broadcasts something about it. 
In other words, we got a real current of rumor going on. And what they did was they announced, well, yeah, that we've got a flying saucer. It gets up to the higher headquarters, and they're, they're, the people at Roswell are made to look like dummies. Well, they, they, they didn't recognize this weather balloon, this strange weather balloon. And what that effectively did was shut off all the rumors. You'd say, well, there was some talk of a flying saucer. And we'd say, oh, it's just a weather balloon. Everybody knows that. Sure. So they effectively shut off the rumors. They took a calculated risk, announced, had the high, lower headquarters announce that they had a flying saucer, and then the higher headquarters, the general said, no, no, that was a mistake. And, and it worked perfectly because... You can, you, if, you, if you track the story through the newspapers, you have an awful lot of newspapers talking about um, the crash and, and, and the mystery, but you have even more talking about the explanation. So what they've done is they've shut down the rumors. And I think that was why they made that press release was, was a calculated risk to say, yes, we have a flying saucer, and then to identify it as something mundane, and you stop all the rumors. Mm -hmm. All right, um, sir, I'd like to give out my post office box. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the Cosmic Connection. Post office box 86, 186 Portland, Oregon, zip code 97286. Uh, Mr. Randall, do you have a, uh, a telephone number or an organization or an address that you'd like to give out to the, uh, the people and our viewers tonight? Well, Don, both Don and I can be con contacted through the Center for UFO Studies at 250. Uh, I'm sorry, 2457 West Peterson Avenue in Chicago, 60659, and that's area code 312-271-3611. And if you don't get the phone number or something, you can call Direct Resistance and get it. I just ask for the uh, Center for UFO Studies, and they'll be able to find it in the Chicago telephone directory for you. All right. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, uh, at this point, I'd, I'd like to uh, move on. I think we've basically covered the events that, are, that a crash happened with uh, alien bodies and was cr recovered by the uh, military. And we have, like you say, several hundred first and second hand witnesses. I'd like to move into some of the new events that we're, we weren't able to cover in the first book or in your last lecture here, because I find a lot of this stuff really exciting. The new stuff that you've uncovered, such as first hand witnesses, uh, archaeologists, etc. Let's move into some of the new items. Sure. What would you like to know? <laughs> okay, well, as, as far as uh, the first book, how many first and second hand witnesses we had and how many new first hand witnesses and second hand witnesses we've uncovered since then? I think what's really important is, is, is not ne necessarily how many are first and second hand witnesses, but what we've been able to do on the impact side. In the first book, we talk about the debris field, and we give good descriptions of what was happening there and, the, and what the debris was like. But when we moved in the area of, of the craft and the bodies, we were forced to deal with a couple of second-hand sources and, and uh, that sort of thing. We didn't have good information to, to lead us toward the bodies. And that was, I think, why Gerald Anderson made such a splash, is because he alleged to be a first-hand source, and, of course, he blew up. But what we've been able to do is we have eight solid first-hand sources who were on the impact that saw the craft in the bodies. Wow. And didn't, now, is it true that I've heard that at least one body was alive? We have heard this as well, and we have, but we've only gotten that from second-hand sources. Frankie Rowe, for example, her father was a member of the Roswell Fire Department. I, I have the article right in front of me. That's a UFO universe written by yourself. And we talk about Frankie Rowe. We talk about Barbara Duggar. The problem is they are second-hand sources. Barbara, uh, Barbara Duggar talked about what her grandfather, Sheriff Wilcox, saw. Frankie Rowe talks about what her father, uh, the firefighter, saw. Neither one of them saw anything firsthand. Okay. Of the firsthand witnesses we've talked to, they have suggested that none survived, uh, none survived to be seen alive by civilians, or, or I mean by the, by the people from Earth. And, well, and how, we, what we don't know now at, at this point is the... the the way to answer the question best is the first-hand sources all say they were all dead, but there is an indication that one may have survived, and it could possibly be that something happened on that impact site that those first-hand witnesses don't want to mention. We don't know. That's completely and totally speculation on, on our part that something happened there. All we can say with, with a great deal of, of confidence is that the, the craft crashed, there were five alien bodies associated with it, and there is an indication that one may have survived the crash. But we now, do not have good first-hand testimony to that, for that yet. Now, now uh, Glenn Dennis was a mortician, is that correct? And didn't he stumble upon some bodies and, and speak with the nurse? 
Glenn Dennis never saw the bodies. Glenn Dennis spoke to a nurse at the Roswell Army Airfield at the base hospital who told him that he, she had seen, I think, three bodies. Um, and, and, you know, so there's a, is there a discrepancy between the three bodies she saw and the five bodies on the crash site? Absolutely not. Right. Uh, she only saw three. Doesn't mean there weren't five. Sure. Just means she only saw three of them. Yeah. And, and so she told Glenn Dennis what she had seen and drew him a little sketch of it, and we reproduced the sketch in our first book of what uh, she saw. What we reproduced in the second book are sketches from first-hand sources of what they saw. The sketches are amazingly similar, considering that the uh, sketches by, uh, by Glenn Dennis were filtered through another source. In other words, um, uh, you know, Glenn Dennis didn't see anything himself. He saw drawings made by, by his friend, the nurse. Our witnesses that we're dealing with now can say to us, this is what I saw. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, also, uh, Dennis, I believe, uh, wanted to bring something up. Uh, I understand we found some of the archaeologists now. Yeah, you see, and that's, that's a problem we run into with the Barney Barnett story. Barney Barnett, of course, was a civil engineer who told a number of his friends that uh, he had been involved in some fashion in this crash, and everybody assumed, based on where he worked, I don't think he ever located it himself, but based on where he worked, that there was a crash of an alien spacecraft on the plains of San Augustine. And in the, at the beginning of the Roswell investigation, that, that was the only story that led us to bodies, and so there was a real desire to keep that story alive. And he said that there were a number of archaeologists on the site that he had seen. Well, of course, that it, uh, uh, started a, a huge search for them, and I think between Tom Carey and me, we have talked to every living archaeologist who was working in New Mexico in 1947, beginning with the plains of San Augustine. And when we couldn't find anybody on the plains, any archaeologists on the plains who would relate the story, we kept expanding the search outward. So that we talked to every archaeologist who was in New Mexico. We went through the Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe, the University of New Mexico, the, the Museum of New Mexico, the various publications uh, put out by all kinds of uh, anthropological and archaeological societies looking for these people. And after uh, all this was done, we eventually located a number of people. We found the archaeologists. So with the Barney Barnett story, he, he, he tells this story. He, it's in the wrong location, but he knows about archaeologists. Now, the thing you have to remember is the archaeologists were just north of Roswell. They were not on the plains of San Augustine. The archaeologists we found were working on... Uh, what they call a site survey north of Roswell, New Mexico, when they found it. We found one vertebrate paleontologist who was not directly involved who saw the military cordon off to the west, but since he didn't want to go west, he just noted that it was there and continued on. And when we inadvertently found this guy, he put us on to who the archaeologists were who were working with it, and I talked to the, uh, we believe it was the leader of the expedition, uh -huh. about this event, and... I saw him in November of 1992. He died April 21st of this year. I see. So oh. we, we just got to him before he passed away. And, right. and, the, and I made a special trip to visit with him because when we found him, he was 96 years old, and we were afraid that he would go at any moment. Sure. This points up a problem I think uh, you mentioned you're having with a lot of your witnesses is because of this late date, a lot of them are either already dead or passing away shortly thereafter you get a hold of them. Well, as I say, Tom, Tom in, his, in his section of the, uh, uh, in, in part of his investigation, he sent me a list of, I think it's around 60 different archaeologists or, or people interested in this field that we've contacted, uh, and, and, and the list is only about a quarter of the ar anthropologists and archaeologists we've gone through. And on that list is like seven or eight asterisks, and the asterisk denotes people who have died since we first contacted them. So we're, we're losing a lot of those people. Other people that we talked to that turned out to be very important, Edwin Easley, for example, was the provost marshal of the 509th Bomb Group, and we had a number of very good conversations with him before he passed away uh, about a year ago. Louis Rickett, the counterintelligence sergeant who was out on the impact site and the debris field, passed away uh, a year ago in October. Uh, Marion Strickland, who... who um, uh, worked, uh, lived in the area and talked to Mac Brazel and could fill us in on that. She died uh, about a year and a half ago. Thomas DuBose, the chief of staff of 8th Air Force, General Ramey's uh, number two man at uh, 8th Air Force headquarters, died 
about a year ago. So yes, we've lost an awful lot of the witnesses. Fortunately, a great deal of the information is on audio or videotape now. And one of the things we did, and the Fund for UFO Research helped a little bit with this, is providing funding so that we could get these taped interviews so that we would have, um, you might say, a, a uh, oral history or a video history of, of some of this testimony so that it's no longer really my interpretation of what he told me. It's here's what the fellow told us on, on videotape, and you can take a look at it yourself. All right. I'd, I'd like to interrupt. Uh, camera floor, if you could uh, zoom in on, on this uh, white placard we have here. We're looking at a map of Roswell, New Mexico, the New Mexico map. I'd like to show uh, to, the, to the ladies and gentlemen that are watching this program, we have a San Augusta Plains, uh, the crash near Roswell. Uh, we have... We have three places that we're dealing with. Is that correct, Mr. Randall? We're dealing with the San Augusta Plains, we're dealing with the Mac Braswell Ranch, and we're dealing with the crash site itself, 35 to 40 miles east of the Mac Braswell Ranch. Is that correct? Or, or about 40, 30 miles uh, due north of Roswell. The actual impact site is just north of Roswell. Right. So, and so the, the, the thing you have to remember is the Plains of San Augustine this is what I want to show our audience right now. If we could, Mr. Director, if you could show that uh, map of uh, New Mexico. There, there it is right there. If we could get a little closer in on that. And sir, we're looking at a map. Uh, no, the other, the other map. The other map that you had the first time. Right, that one right there. Okay. Uh, if you see on, I guess, if you look at your screen on the left-hand side of the corner, you're seeing the San Augusta Plains, then the Trinity Bomb Site. Then you're dealing with the Mac Brazel Ranch, and then you have Roswell. Is that correct, Dennis? Am I reading that right on the monitor? That's correct. And uh, Mr. Randall, uh, we're going to hold that map there, and if you'd like to show us the sequence of events of uh, just what happened or what's allegedly, supposedly happened at the San Augusta Plains. Well, nothing happened there. Okay. The best information we have is nothing happened there. We have found absolutely no confirmation Very of it. Very good. The, the single first-hand witness to an event on the plains of San Augustine was Gerald Anderson, and he was lying. So we could strike that out of our books. I Augusta, think so. Just... What we believe, what we believe happened is Barney Barnett, who lived in Socorro, right. and, and as a soil conservation engineer, that was the area he normally worked. Barney Barnett told Vern Maltese, Alice Knight, uh, Fleck Danley about this flying saucer event. Now, when the initial investigation began back in the early, uh, sorry, the late 1970s, the question that was asked was where, was, where did Barney work? He normally worked west of Socorro, west of Magdalena, on the plains of San Augustine. So the assumption was he saw something there. We have been unable, in our research, to find any corroboration of an event on the plains. So we've eliminated that from our way of thinking. Now, right. if, if our sequence is correct, uh, based, on, based on the eyewitness testimony and the documentation, the crash took place on July 4th. The military recovered the craft and bodies on the 5th. Barnett could not possibly have been involved because he was home in Socorro, according to a diary his wife kept. No way for him to see anything. What we suspect may have happened is he heard the story from one of the archaeologists or right. one of the anthropologists because in the course of his uh, work as a soil conservation engineer, he would have come across these people. And we have, in fact, been able to place one of the guys who we believe was involved in Roswell on the plains of San Augustine the following year. So he may have mentioned this to Barnett, and, and Barnett told the story to friends, and they misinterpreted what he was saying. We don't know what happened here. All we can say with a, with a great deal of confidence is that Barney Barnett did not see the the craft and the bodies that crashed at Roswell and there's absolutely no solid evidence that, uh, that anything happened on the plains of San Augustine. Go, go ahead Dennis. Uh, Kevin, what's the running total on how many military, first-hand military witnesses we have now? I have no clue. <laughs> we yeah. have a great number of them. The vast majority of the people we have are military witnesses. There really? are of course some civilian witnesses involved. First-hand military witnesses? First-hand, yes. You have too many to count? Uh, no, what I'm saying is, in, in various parts of the event, yeah, we have, we have a, a great number of, of first-hand military witnesses on the impact site with the craft and bodies. 
Wow. I, we have we have probably probably five or six first hand military witnesses and a couple of civilian witnesses that saw the craft in bodies. Now from that uh, how about the number of people that saw debris this bizarre debris there's at least 36 first hand witnesses to that that we know of uh, the majority of them military but but some of them civilian for example Bill Brazel the the son of the man that found it had that piece of foil that when he wadded it up it unfolded itself. We know he showed it to Sally Tettolini, who was the daughter of Marion Strickland, so she got to see it. Loretta Proctor saw a piece of debris that Mac Brazel had. Tommy Tyree, who was a ranch hand, saw a piece of debris that Mac Brazel pointed out to him. So there's a number of civilian witnesses who saw debris. On the other side, there are a number of military witnesses who saw and described debris. Major Jesse Marcel saw it. Um, uh, and they all speak of being threatened with death, men, women, and children back then? Um, the, a, a number of them do, yeah. Glenn Dennis talked about it. Uh, 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 Barbara Duggar said the sheriff was threatened that way. Uh, Frankie Rowe tells about the, the um, uh, soldiers that came to the house and threatened her, um, that they'd take her out into the desert and she'd never come back. So, yeah, there are a number of people, both adults and children, who were threatened that way. Now, the military people were not really threatened, but they were reminded constantly of their military oaths that uh, this is classified top secret, you cannot speak about it. And I think that Edwin Easley uh, put it all in perspective for us, and I wasn't going to mention this, but I will anyway, when he told us, when he said that he couldn't talk about it because he'd promised the president he wouldn't. We don't know whether he told Harry Truman himself he wouldn't talk about it, or if he talked to Truman's duly appointed representative, because we know there were two Secret Service agents at Roswell that came in on special flights. But we know that, that a number of people were, were promised the president they would not speak about this, and they, they lived up to their oaths for the most part. So what we have is a large number of people who were involved in various aspects of this thing who can give us first-hand testimony. I, 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 Robert Smith, for example, was a sergeant at the 509th Bomb Group, helped load the aircraft with all these crates that felt like they contained nothing and saw a piece of the, the, the foil-like debris. Here's a sergeant from the 509th Bomb Group. So we have a wide range of both military and civilian witnesses who saw uh, the debris. There's, another, there's a number of people who were involved in various aspects of it. We've learned of flight crews that were involved in aspects of taking debris to uh, uh, Fort Worth and on to Wright Field and other flight crews that flew the bodies out and that sort of thing. But these people, you're saying, direct, directly implicate the president as in having knowledge of this event. I think there's no question that an event like this would know it, the president would know it. General Exxon, when we spoke to him, made it clear that the president's office was informed about this, as was at the time it would have been the Secretary of War and then the Secretary of Defense. It was in the period of transition in July, I think, that uh, Forrestal became the first Secretary of Defense late in July of 47. So you've got, I think his name was Patterson, as the, the last Secretary of War, and Forrestal coming into this thing. But, but according to Exxon, Forrestal was involved in this, as was General Spatz, who was the head of the Army Air Forces in July of 1947, as was Dwight Eisenhower, who was the uh, chairman, not chairman, but the chief of staff of the Army in 1947, who, who went on to become president, of course. Uh, so, General? yes, there's, there's no question that, that the very highest levels of government, these people knew what was going on, and their policy was des designed specifically to keep the rest of us in the dark. Uh, Mr. Rano, I'd like to um, ask you a uh, couple of quick questions here. Could you quickly elaborate on the red-headed sergeant? And also, um, what, what, uh, if, if UFOs are proven to be true, what would the negative effect on Christianity be or, or on religion? Or do you cover this aspect? Or has anything uh, happened to you uh, with, in, in anything of this regard? Uh, a lot of people uh, write to me and ask me about this uh, Christianity and the, and, and the major religious aspect of, uh, of alien beings. Well, you kind of all over the map there, aren't yeah. you? The the red there was a red-haired captain that Glenn Dennis spoke of of having a very bad attitude and right. threatening to threatening to do him in. And and wasn't it possible that he was at like this Phoenix uh, or uh, uh, Kingman crash? 
Not that not that we're aware of. Okay. Not that we're aware of. The um, in the history of the UFO crashes, we do a little bit more with the Kingman Kingman event because we've got a couple of additional firsthand witness witnesses to that event, other than just the one that uh, has been been talked about in the past. Uh, Fritz Warner. We found uh, Don actually, I should say, found a couple of additional witnesses to that. But that but that's uh, a, another another event. Uh, the red-haired, the red-haired officer is, is uh, somebody with a bad attitude that Glenn Dennis had talked about, and he talked about him working with a black NCO. Sure. Now, when Gerald Anderson surfaced, he talked about a nasty red-haired captain that he named Armstrong in a in a in a nasty black NCO. But what we believe happened is that, uh, according according to to um, some of the things we've been able to discover, is is uh, Stanton Friedman had sent. Uh, Anderson a package of material before anybody had a chance to really interview him, and in that package of material was undoubtedly this information about the red-haired captain. So that's that's how Anderson learned about it. Was he's he was inadvertently briefed uh, about it by Stanton Friedman. Um, Mr. Reno, I'd like to interrupt uh, for a moment right here. We're going to order a pizza from Sonny's Pizza. Uh, you're calling from where? Uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, just bear with us one moment, and uh, we'll see uh, if we can't get a pizza from Sonny's Pizza here. Hello, Jim McKee, how you doing, my friend? Yes, I'd like to order two pizzas for the Cosmic Connection. I understand you're working very hard today. Right on, Jim. Yes, sir, two pizzas for the Cosmic Connection. That's correct. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, um, Dennis, did you have a, another comment for Mr. Randall? Uh, well, as we were speaking, uh, as the government, I wanted to uh, find out if there's been any new congressional interest in this case since the last time we spoke. Very good, yeah. Did you get that, sir? We hadn't had an opportunity to talk about the religious aspects of it. That's right. And, and that was you know, part of your two-pronged question. And I, I think that uh, Don, uh, my partner, has, has spoken to a number of theologians about this. And it, it, it's his uh, reading on what he's, he's learned from them that this really doesn't have any kind of uh, negative implications for Christianity. It's if if God can create the heaven and, earth and, and, and heavens and earth, why limit His creative ability by only I'm, coming up with one intelligence race? Why absolutely. not? Why not other races on other planets? Absolutely. Uh, and and I, I think that the majority of the theologians don't see it as uh, as a threat to to organized religion. That uh, if if it was proved that there was life on other planets, it certainly does not. Uh, eliminate Christianity or any of the religions. It just it just sort of uh, opens it up to the more magnificence of what's going on out uh, there. Captain Randall, uh, I see we have a pizza here. Uh, we're going to have a pizza delivered from Sonny's Pizza. Hello. Hello. I have a pizza here from Sonny's Pizza for the Cosmic Connection. Great. Thank you. And you're Gina. You were here last week. Yes, I was. Great, and you have a festive hat on for the occasion? Yes, all of us at Sunny's Pizza want to wish you all a happy holiday season. Very good, very good. And from the Cosmic Connection also, uh, Gina, thank you very much for uh, delivering this for us today. Uh, Mr. Rano, I think we'll uh, airship one you out to, uh, like we did for Mr. Uh, Don Schmidt. Uh, courtesy of uh, Roswell Air Force Base. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to have some pizza uh, and uh, get together when you uh, uh, come to town. And Gina, thank you very much, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. And, Happy uh, holidays. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to you, too. Uh, Dennis, did you uh, have uh, one more comment? We have about uh, uh, 11 minutes left. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching The Cosmic Connection on Channel 11 Live. This is December 5th, 1993. We're honored to have Kevin D. Randall here of the UFO crash at Roswell. My guest here is uh, Dennis again. He's just gotten back from uh, the Republic of China on a uh, quest looking for uh, aliens over China of a new pamphlet that we're working on along with our companion pamphlet, Aliens Over Oregon. Uh, Dennis, take it away, pal. Yeah, soon to be Republic of China. It's still a colony of uh, the British at the moment, but uh, what I wanted to touch on was uh, the congressional interest in this case up to this point and uh, where we're at up till now. I think that uh, I, I, I think there's very little serious congressional interest in UFOs and the crash at Roswell. I think Cliff Stone has has done some good work by interesting them in what is called Project Moon Dust, 
and Moon Dust was a, or is, a government uh, program with the express purpose, the written purpose, uh, the mission of, of recovering space debris from foreign nations or of unknown origins. I mean, this is laid out in documentation that we have, and there's no question the documentation is authentic. And, and so uh, we know that moon dust existed, and when there were some congressional inquiries about it, the Air Force wrote back and said moon dust never existed. There was no such project. And when they looked at the documentation, they, they, they returned to the senators and said, well, we'd like to amend our last statement. There was a project moon dust, but it doesn't exist anymore. We have further documentation that shows that moon dust, the, the name, since it was compromised, was changed to something else. So moon dust was a, a governmental-sponsored uh, activity with the express purpose of, of looking for returning space debris or space debris of unknown origin. And I think that the Project Moondust people were called out at the Kecksburg UFO crash in 1965. I think there's enough uh, good evidence to link them to that so we know that they were involved in that. Part of the documentation, part of the definitions in the Moondust documents is uh, for UFOs. So they clearly had a mission of, of attempting to recover UFOs. Right. Now, um, I'd like to, uh, have, what, what studies have you done on this UFO crash at Aztec? And, and did this also happen? Aztec is a hoax. It's bogus. Good. And, and okay. I think that the IUR, the International UFO Reporter, put out by the Center for UFO Studies, had a real interesting article done by some people who live in Ohio, and they wanted to determine how far they could go on an investigation of the Aztec case without ever setting foot, foot in New Mexico by using the telephones and the mails and contacted a lot of the people involved in the Aztec crash or the Aztec uh, non-event on the phone or wrote letters to them and they were able to determine to their satisfaction that nothing happened at Aztec. No. I've been into the area and I haven't been able to, d to determine anything happened there. It's, it's, it's uh, a hoax that just resurfaces every 10 or 12 years. Okay. Now, now the Kecksburg thing. I've written, I've written uh, several things on the Pen that was in Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, this was uh, an acorn-shaped thing, and uh, uh, the latest article I read on this one was about uh, is saying that it could have been um, a U.S. Uh, a, a Russian satellite. There is some indications that Cosmos 96 might be responsible for the events at Kecksburg, but there are some problems with the timing of the events. The, the Cosmos 90, 96 supposedly broke up and fell to Earth 13 hours before things were seen at Kecksburg. Oh, okay. I see. So, okay. so there is some question about that. But Kex the, Ke the, the Kecksburg um, sighting uh, was stated that it, it definitely made a, a, a left or a right angle turn. Uh, I, I think that, I, I think what's happened here is that when, when some of the events that were associated with the Kecksburg were plotted on a map. It appeared to make a turn, okay. but it didn't make a turn until it got into the Kecksburg area. Now, talking to Stan Gordon, who's done the lion's share of the work here, he tells me that he has some witnesses who saw it maneuvering just before it impacted the Earth. So that would tend to rule out a returning Soviet spacecraft or a meteorite. But, but uh, uh, you know, there's, there's more of that. Again, the history of the UFO crashes, which will be out about this time next year, I believe, Right. Uh, has a long section on Kecksburg, and it deals with with that and, and a lot of information that Stan Gordon shared with me. So, now, now, sir, will this will this book have illustrations in it? I've I've, I've read quite a few UFO books, and and um, I'm totally uh, thoroughly interested in in the literature. But a lot of people state that they don't want to look at it, you know, for for reasons uh, laziness or what have you. Uh, diagrams, maps, illustrations really uh, get get. The, the public, I, I would say, get the public's attention, and, and just the more uh, pictures that, that can be gotten or uh, updated photos. Uh, I believe uh, UFO photos, uh, everything that we seem to see are, are dated from the 50s and 60s. Am I correct on this assumption? Well, I think Kevin covered in that they have a new movie coming out also for people that are too lazy to read the book, sure. such as you mentioned. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the, the, the book, both, both the history of UFO crashes and the truth about UFO crash at Roswell will have plenty of illustrations. And in, in the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, we're going to publish for the first time uh, eyewitness drawings of what the beings killed at the crash look like. And one of the things that Don had done is he put together what you might consider a photo laydown. Uh, something like a police police would use, and he drew 
uh, various alien faces or heads, sure. and then had the witnesses sure. select the one that most closely resembled what they saw. And invariably, they selected the same one, even though they weren't communi in communication with one another. So here's a level of corroboration that we've been able to uh, ob obtain on this case. So yes, there will be illustrations, there will be photographs in, in the books that uh, uh, will give you an idea of what the craft looked like at Roswell. Uh, the real key here is to take a look at the Rhodes photo taken in 1957, or I'm Very sorry, good. 1947. And this was taken in Phoenix um, on the 7th of July, so it's it's between the the uh, crash at Roswell and the and the announcement of the press release that this photo was taken. When can we expect the movie to come out? The movie should be uh, out in uh, the summer sometime, and they they keep changing the. Uh, the release date on it, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure when it's going to come out. Very good. All right, uh, Captain Randall, we're going to have to wind up here. I want to thank you very much for calling us from uh, Iowa, I believe it was. All the way from Iowa. All right, very good, sir. Uh, I look forward to meeting you and your partner. Uh, the times when you get here, uh, Dennis will be taking care of the correspondence. And uh, I want to thank you very much, sir. And uh, if you see your partner, when you see him, uh, greetings from the Cosmic Connection, uh, and uh, season's greetings to you, sir. Well, I'll be delighted to pass those along to him, and season greetings to you, too. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, be well. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Dennis, you have one more comment? One more announcement. Uh, November 3rd, Newsweek announced that uh, Nellis Air Force Base has asked, Listen to this. asked for a new land grab in Lincoln County of 39,000 acres and that will be the end of viewing events at Area 51 at the Mailbox Road, so it's now or never. That's right, uh, the BLM uh, Bureau of Land Management property that you and I own, uh, this property was taken also from Area 51, uh, what was that, the 60s or the 70s? Now they're grabbing more, and uh, at this Area 51 for viewing at the Area 51 site, the Mailbox Road, uh, like Dennis says, look up in the issue of Time Magazine? Uh, Newsweek Magazine, November 3rd. Newsweek Magazine, November 3rd. With that, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching this program. We'll be back January 2nd, Sunday, 1994. Uh, that's going to do it. Billy Goodman, thank you very much. We're going to take telephone. We're going to take your calls after the show at 667-7434. Dennis and myself will uh, talk to you and... Uh, We'll see you next year, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Say they do, but they're just telling lies